Thank you, Professor Olivier. You has been a long time, and uh, I think both of us has been aged uh, <laughs> <laughs> since my graduation, like uh, uh, twelve years ago. Yes. All right. Uh, so, uh, you can I share my screen? Or yes, of course, you should be able to. Okay, just one second, guys. Uh, let me share re my screen. Okay. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen so I yes, can start. I can see. Okay, great. All right. So, uh, good morning, guys, and uh, good morning, future perspective uh, environmental uh, engineering students. Uh, my name is uh, Hong Dou. Um, I was uh, I graduated from the same uh, division uh, in 2009. Uh, that was uh, 12 years ago, and uh, in the in the 12 years of working, uh, I realized that uh, you know environment and energy they always come together, and uh, hence my uh, topic today. You know the path to a sustainable tomorrow. And we are looking at the nexus of energy and environment and how these two are actually coming together. A very quick introduction of myself. Um, I'm environmental engineering by training. And uh, right after graduation, I started my career as a business development uh, for the carbon credits trading. Uh, then I spent uh, six or seven years on the uh, uh, engineering, uh, procurement and construction, EPC companies for both environmental infrastructures and energy infrastructures, including desalination, including uh, waste to energy. And it is actually the waste to energy that brings me to the, the border energy landscape, uh, which is what I'm doing now. Uh, the, gas turbine, you know, power generations for the industries and for the utility sectors. So right now I am with a company called Baker Hughes. Uh, it's a technology company, it's uh, primarily in the oil and the gas sector, but we do have a significant uh, investment in the energy space. And I work as a business development director for Asia Pacific. All right, so let me open the, uh... okay, one second. All right, let me open today's speech by, you know, just giving you guys some sense on the, uh, the United Nations, the sustainable development goals. Uh, th this has been ad adopted by a majority of the countries, you know, as part of the UN United Nations uh, framework where, the countries are focusing, uh, you can see here, a lot of uh, uh, segments, including poverty, standards of living, uh, gender equities. But uh, you can see from point number six, uh, they specific, specifically mentioned the clean water. Uh, that's on the point number six, clean water and the sanitations. In a broader sense, that's what uh, the environmental engineering is doing, you know, providing a uh, wastewater treatment for both the industry and the municipalities, uh, even for the rural areas, as well as providing clean and drinkable, affordable water uh, to the same people. So this is one of the goals here. And if you can look at uh, point number seven, they also mentioned uh, affordable and clean energy, you know, to have uh, access to electricity, to have access to thermal power uh, whenever, you know, we are in, in need. For example, in Singapore, we are using electricity for the air conditionings and in some part of the world that uh, we are also using electricity or thermal heat for, for space, uh, heating in the winter time, for example. And among other things, you can see also there are the targets to, to tackle, uh, to join together, to work together on the climate action. That's on point number 13. And uh, the, the United Nations is also encouraging, encouraging all the countries to look at, uh, you know, the marine life, uh, life below water. That's point number 14. 
And of course, you know, the goals cannot be achieved by a single party or by a single nation. That's why we also emphasized on a partnership. And uh, throughout this entire speech, uh, another 10 minutes, you will hear a lot of focus on the partnerships, you know, uh, on both energy and what uh, energy and the environment in general. And coming back, uh, you know, to where we are uh, is the Singapore, the land of Singapore, and the government basically working on, you know, what we call the Singapore Green Plan uh, with a vision of 2013, another nine years, that uh, to achieve a nationwide sustainability, sustainability goal, including, uh, you can read uh, the brochures here, including sustainable living, the living style, including green government. And so what matters to us, you know, as the environmental engineering students, I think you can look at the, for example, the green buildings under the energy reset, uh, greener infrastructures and the buildings where the country is targeting to have more than 80% of the building uh, to be uh, qualified or certified as a green building in terms of energy efficiencies, in terms of water consumption efficiencies. In the same country here, we also look at the green energy, you know, how we are able to decarbonize the energy that we are using. Uh, for example, just to give you guys a sense on where we are in Singapore. In Singapore, we are burning a lot of uh, natural gas to generate electricity uh, that we are consuming every day, every minute. And uh, natural gas, I, I shouldn't say this because there's a quiz, but uh, natural gas is still able to emit CO2, carbon dioxide, which is a contributor to the global warming, to the climate change. So the country is working on ways and means to reduce the emissions of CO2, to increase the percentage of green energy in Singapore, including you know, the renewable energy here, for example, solar PV. You see that a lot of the buildings, the HDB buildings, some of the industry park, they already have the PV solar panels on the rooftop. All right, so that's a form of uh, a renewable energy or green energy that the government is focusing. But there are definitely more technologies the government is considering, uh, you know, in the sense of, uh, again, what we are working on as environmental disciplines, including technologies like desalination, we still have to provide uh, su uh, sufficient water for the domestic consumption. And the Singapore being an island country without a lot of underground water. And uh, we are using technologies like membrane, which you will learn once you are in the uh, university. The membrane technologies, for example, to produce drinkable clean water from the seawater. And uh, another very interesting topic the government is uh, formulating, same as the the, the university has been promoting for some time already is on the clean water, you know, like the new water uh, facilities, uh, recycling the, the, the municipal, so, uh, municipal wastewater into a drinkable clean water for consumptions, both for the people and for the industries. There are also futuristic technologies that uh, companies like uh, Angie and uh, Baker Hughes are working on as well. For example, hydrogen. Hydrogen as a fuel that's uh, able to produce electricity without uh, emitting any pollutant. Because hydrogen, I think you know that, uh, but, uh, you know, a simple chemical reaction, H2 uh, hydrogen plus O2 oxygen, will give you H2O, will give you water. So the only emission here, uh, the major emission here is H2O other than uh, NOx, that's the NOx. And uh, another technology is, is also coming into a reality is what we call the carbon capture utilization and the storage. Uh, 
you know, where, where we are able to capture the CO2 from the industry, from the power plants and uh, utilize it in a different form, uh, basically to reduce the consumption, uh, sorry, to reduce the emission of CO2s. So the government has been very pragmatic and uh, it's not a very ambitious goal. It is a goal based on technology readiness, based on the uh, constraints the government is facing as well. For example, we like to have more solar panels on the rooftop, but you know, the, the land in Singapore is, is limited. We are unable to have more than what we are capable to do. And in terms of the energy perspective, uh, you know, if you guys follow the international trend on the energy, on the power, you will see this uh, key words a lot. For example, net zero, that focus on the net CO2 emission, we call the net zero. Digitalization, that means, you know, especially, you know, since last year with the COVID situation, uh, a lot of people is unable to return to work and they have to work remotely. So how do we digitalize the industry assets to enable a remote monitoring and the remote mo uh, maintenance that something has gained a lot of uh, popularities in the last uh, year and a half. And definitely energy security, you know, to have a stable, uh, re reliable power supply that enable the resilience of uh, having consistent uh, access to the power is super important. Just to give you guys a quick example here by what I mean by, you know, saying energy security or energy resilience. Uh, even in countries like USA, you know, if you guys see the news or saw the news in February this year, uh, cities like Houston, because of the storm, snowstorm, they lost power. Majority of the city, Houston, lost power for 48, 72 hours. And uh, it is unbelievable. So for small country like Singapore, how do we ensure we have a sufficient uh, backup power uh, in the case of emergency? How do we ensure that the supply of the fuel uh, is uh, stable? Those are the things we observed a lot. You know, the government's efforts, the private sector's efforts, even the companies like Angie, that uh, they are focusing very much on this as well. And this came to the, uh, the, the main topic of today, you know, uh, water, energy, waste, or in general environment and uh, energy. How does this two or three come together? As I said in the beginning, how exactly where I landed in the energy company or in the energy space, you know, working as a business development is actually, you know, from one of our of our uh, modules in the school, I remember is uh, Professor He, that uh, she taught us the municipal solid waste management, MSW, municipal solid waste management, and uh, basically how we treat the garbage uh, in general, you know, including the collections, recyclings, but if essentially, well, as well as landfill. But essentially, again, with the land constraint in Singapore, there has to be a means to reduce the volume of the MSW significantly. And that's where the incineration, the waste to energy facility come into the discussion. I also remember at that time, you know, during the module, uh, during the learning, we visited one of the incineration plants in Singapore. And uh, if you guys ever have the chance, I encourage you to go there to take a look, you know, how massive the plant is or how compact the plant is to treat a couple thousand tons of steam every single day, you know, to then to reduce the volume by over 95%. So actually, when I started my, my career in the companies like Capo, 
where they also build with two energy it immediately, you know, sort of resonate with what I'm trying to do. So in the work, uh, on the job, I will say, I, I, st I spend more time to really understand how the incineration plants work and uh, where, for example, the, the garbage going to be burned and uh, where the heat is going to be collected and eventually how the steam turbine is working because your, your, your boiler, your steam generation has to convert into electrical power, right? So that's where the steam turbine is coming to the overall solution. That's where I developed a keen interest in the energy space in general. And after that, uh, again, this is uh, on the job training or based on your personal interest, you know, so I look into uh, gas turbines as well, how we burn natural gas and produce electricity and how we couple the gas turbine with steam turbine to produce electricity. And that's where I am today. So I will say, you know, one simple module in the universities that really that's like the, the, the eye opener for me into the bigger energy space. But coming back to this uh, energy environment nexus, this is actually what uh, Singapore government, uh, NEA, the National Environment Agency, and the PUB, Public Utility Board, uh, they've been developing since uh, five, six years ago from a concept solution to today where most of the facilities you are looking at in this picture has been developed already, has been physically built already. I will explain to you a little bit how the, for example, how the energy flows and how the water flows within this uh, integrate uh, environmental energy solutions. So on the left-hand side, that's the TWRP. This is the wastewater treatment plant. The T is a TWAS, so it's in the TWAS area. In the water treatment facilities, they have the wastewater treatment facilities that uh, they are generating, you know, reclaim the water, which can be further processed in the new water facilities. And this is the new water facilities. And uh, in the process of the TWRP, there are the solid, there are the, the solid uh, generation from the process, which has to be dehydrated and uh, dewatered and eventually goes to the landfill. But before that, some of the solid waste is also uh, incinerate, uh, incinerable, so they have to burn it. And that's where the IWMF is the integrated waste management facility come into the pictures. So the, the waste to energy here, they are treating, for example, the food kitchen waste. They are recycling the household recyclables, the industry recyclables here. And they are also burning, you know, the municipal solid waste here in the IWMF. In the process of burning this uh, waste, they generate electricity. And uh, the wastewater, the wastewater facility itself, they consume a lot of electricity. You can imagine the amount of the pumps that uh, they are driving, uh, the entire process, the, 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 the high pressure pump driving the water, the, the reclaim the water to push the water through the membrane, that's going to require a significant amount of electricity. And previously, you know, similar plants, they are buying electricity from the national grid. But because of these synergies between these two facilities, they are using the electricity directly from the IWMF. All right. And in the IWMF, as I said, some of the solid, the sludge uh, produced here can be incinerated here. So the synergies is to have 
the entire solution to become self-sufficient in terms of energy consumptions, in terms of the water consumptions as well. In the IWMF, because they are producing electricity through the combustion, so they also require clean water, ultra pure water to produce steam, to turn the steam turbine into electricity basically. So the environment uh, session portion of this solution is uh, on the water and the waste, but you can see that the energy has been here uh, everywhere, either in the pumping, in the pipelines, to push the water through the different processes here and uh, to power the pumping stations. So this is, this is what I see in general, how the energy, how the water industry, how the waste uh, management industries, they are interacting with each other. But even look beyond what uh, we have here in Singapore, in general, globally, you know, for example, to produce desalination uh, water, to produce a fresh water from the sea water for one single qubit of water produced, you are going to require close to two kilowatt hour of electricity. And the two kilowatt hour is able to power, you know, for example, your, your chiller, your fridge for one day or two days. That's the amount of electricity we consume to produce a single cubic meter of water. So the water industry, energy industries, they always come together. And even in the power industry itself, when we look at how we combine the steam turbine and the gas turbine together, water is always needed as a mean to convert mechanical, uh, mechanical energy into electrical energy, into electricity. But that's just you know, what, uh, what uh, we have in Singapore, but I will say the future is worth looking for for the general environmental students. Because you know, if you look at the, where, where the trend is leading, solar, renewable energy, wind turbines, uh, even batteries, as well as ele electric vehicle, EV chargings, uh, industries and buildings in general. And uh, they, first of all, there are the disciplines requirements from what we learn from the school. For example, the HSE, health, safety, and environment. HSE perspective in almost every single sector, every single segment in the market, they require expertise on the HSE. And if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, other perspectives, on um, what we learn, like air qualities in school, you know, for the industries, for the for the uh, for the conventional power industries, air quality is also very very important. Not in the matter of CO two, but in general, how do we mitigate the pollutant from the different uh, industries? That's something what we are going to be taught in the university as well. And beyond that, as what I'm trying to say, the water industry is super critical to have the affordable access to clean water. That's a matter of leaf, a life and the death. So water industry continue to play a super important role in general. And what we learned from the cross uh, disciplines like the civil engineering, the, the project management, those are the, the, the technologies or those are the skill sets you are able to apply basically across no matter you know, which profession you choose uh, in the future after graduation. Those are the things, especially project management. How do you think systematically how do you apply the methodologies you learn from the school going to be benefit to all of us, uh, no matter what we do in the future. 
And with that, I, I, I close my uh, 25 minutes of a talk and uh, thank you very much. And I hope I was able to share with you uh, a little bit on, on the environment and energy and, uh, and uh, the future again is worth looking for. So good luck guys.